so like most kids, um, I grew up loving space. I, I loved space. Um, and when I couldn't really become an astronaut, like many people, I became an astrophysicist instead. Uh, but I also, I also love buildings. So for the last few years, I've been working on, um, on making buildings more sustainable. But I've never been able to combine these two loves. It's been quite frustrating until last year. Because last year, my hero, Elon Musk, came up um, and, and, and presented this, this um, vision of, of going to Mars in the next, in the next decade to so send a, a fleet of spaceships to Mars and send a million people there by the end of the century. And it was a wonderful story, a wonderful vision. It was a 40-story reusable rocket, a 100-day trip to Mars, and that for only $200,000. You know, I'm sold. And uh, at first, I was really in awe of this technological vision. I was, I was very impressed. Um, but by the end, you know, the, he, he, he um, showed this video. And by the end of the video, I was mostly intrigued by the final shot of the video, because it shows this, a barren desert. So if we're going to move a million people to Mars, and this is what it looks like, where are they going to live? And what kind of buildings? How will we build them? And how will we make them sustainable? So to, to answer these questions, um, I'd like to take you on a trip with me. So a few years ago, um, my fiance treated me for my birthday on a, on a camping trip. But we didn't just take our bags and, and went camping. Um, we went camping by kayak, which meant that we had to load our kayaks with everything we needed for this trip. So we lo loaded up our tent, sleeping bags, very carefully measured amounts of food. We have the spreadsheet with down to the gram of, of how much food we brought. And there wasn't any firewood on, on the island. So we, uh, so we took firewood with us as well. And um, we loaded our kayaks and paddled to the middle of the lake. And we stayed on this beautiful island for, for two short days, sadly. And then you know, we had to break up camp and go back to society. And why am I telling you this? Well, because so far, that's kind of what we've been doing in space. You know, we went to the moon on a camping trip. We, we took a tent, a lunar lander. Um, we took freeze-dried food. We took a fuel cell to power, the, um, to power the, the expedition. And we stayed for three days. That was the longest uh, stay on, on the moon. And then we went back with a few souvenirs. And this is also kind of what we've been so far, you know, have in mind for Mars. So this is a drawing from the 80s, illustrating what scientists were planning then in a mission for Mars. And you can see many of the same elements um, that, were, that were needed for the moon. So it's a, it's a bit of a thicker, bulkier uh, lander, suitable for a longer trip, because uh, Mars is 300 times further away than, than the moon is. So if you go, you have to go for longer. Um, and you have to have a bigger, faster rocket to get there. You, you need a nuclear reactor to power your, st your stay. And uh, you need to deal with the psychological issues that come from a long period of isolation. But ultimately, it is a bit like a, a camping trip. And um, you know, there's, there's a few challenges, but most of these challenges are surmountable. And the real question is of political will and money. But technically, it can be done. We, we can camp on Mars. So, um, so the question here is then, why, you know, what will we need to do to make Mars more than a camping trip? So it's a bit like going from building a tent to building a house. You know, you'll need more protection against the elements. You'll need, um, you'll need a sturdier, bigger building. And you'll need a steady supply of fuel. So let's start with the protection against the elements. So it doesn't rain on Mars, but there's a lot of radiation because of its thin atmosphere and lack of magnetic field. And this is fine for a short stay. And by short, I mean three years. So it's fine for a short, relatively short stay. But if you stayed for 20 years, uh, one in three inhabitants would get cancer. So what you need to do is have a very thick layer of, um, of material between you, like a meter or so, between you and the radiation to shield yourself. And that's quite bulky. 
So, and Mars is far, and it's expensive to bring stuff there. So, that we can't really do that. So we'll have to find local materials and have to look locally. We can't just take everything with us. Um, so, what can you do? Well, so you can either go underground. So you can either dig yourself a hole and, or build on top, of your, um, on top of your building, or you can find one of the caves that Mars has and be a sort of original settler, be a caveman. Now, that's a good option, um, and it will work. Uh, and another option is to, to sort of take the local building materials. So if it turns out that if you take sand of Mars called regolith, if you take that and compress it with enough force, it turns into a brick that's stronger than reinforced concrete. And this is because of the high iron content of the soil, which is also why it's red, because it's rust colored. It's basically made of rust. So that's quite a good option. And in recent years, we've also learned that Mars has a lot of water on, on the polar caps, but also underneath the surface. So another marvelous solution, I love this one, is to dig up the water um, and melt it and shape into an ice house. And the benefit is not just, it, I mean, it is really cool, but it's not just cool, because it also, uh, it is, it's also a good idea because it lets in light for the plants that you want to grow and for the, the sort of daylight that we all need as humans. So, you know, it seems like we have the materials on Mars we need to build, a place that we can live in for years. But it's not exactly easy to build stuff on Mars because, well, there's no workforce, at least not for a while. And even if there was a workforce, can you imagine laying bricks in a very clunky spacesuit? It'd be a nightmare. Um, and, you know, thirdly, because of the radiation, you kind of want the buildings to be finished before you get there. So you kind of want to land up and have your building ready for you. So with this in mind, NASA launched a few innovation challenges two years ago to look at how we could use robotics on Mars to build a building. And one common approach is to take plastic that we bring from Earth and fill, sort of build a wall and then fill it with Martian sand. And this works pretty well because you only need to bring, bring a bit of plastic that's quite lightweight, and most of the bulky stuff you can find there. So this is a good solution. But the tricky thing is, if you have one or two complicated machines and something goes wrong, you're stuck. You can't fix them, especially if you've sent them before you go. Uh, and a lot of stuff goes wrong on Mars. So far, half of Mars landings have failed. So this is quite risky. And that's why there's another method which is what, really my favorite, which is to use many, many small robots that work together like insects to, to sort of, as a swarm, to build something. And the benefit of this is that even if half of them break, that you still have the other half building something for you. And even if it takes longer, it is a solid process that, that, that will complete. And of course, this is a very slick visualization. Um, but it's actually something that people are looking at in real life as well. So I'm sitting over there somewhere. Yep, that's me. Um, and I, I, I was in Sweden for a week uh, with a, a team of the architectural firm Foster and & Partners. And we were looking at how to make these robots. So we made the robots. We, we programmed them with very basic intelligence. And the, and the real challenge was to look at how they explore the landscape. How did they share the knowledge with each other? And how do they coordinate so that they can actually work together like insects? And it was a great week. Um, so research in this field is actually accelerating. And a few, few tests at scale are being planned for the next few years. So whether we do it via 3D printers or robots working like a swarm, I have a lot of confidence that we can actually build something on Mars. But the, the next question is, can we, can we power what we build? Because we'll need a lot of power on Mars. For one, we'll need electricity to, to construct the buildings. You know, these robots are not going to work for free. Then we'll need, you know, we'll need to heat our buildings, and we'll need, to use, we'll need a lot of light to grow our food and, 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 um, and power of, uh, our house. So one problem is Mars has no fossil fuels, unless we suddenly discover that they you know, we had an ancient civilization, but they have no fossil fuels. 
And because the wind is, um, because the atmosphere is 100 times thinner than it is on Earth, you know, despite what you see in the Martian of these big storms, yeah, the, the wind is fast, but it's very thin, so it doesn't really do anything. So you can't rely on wind energy. So really, all we can do is solar. So, um, so let's actually take a little example and say, OK, we have London, we have Mars. And it, you know, people who live in London don't like the weather. It's cold in London. But Mars is quite a bit colder. <laughs> so although on Mars, you, have, you will have days that are sort of 25 degrees, but then the nights will be minus 55. So it gets, it gets really cold. So you need to heat. Um, and even if, uh, and, and the amount of sunlight that you get because of the distance is about half, is less than half than that is on Earth. So even if you take really efficient solar panels and you insulate your building really well, you'll still need four to five times the amount of solar panels on Mars as you do on Earth for the same purpose. But um, it can be done. It's just a question of bringing a lot of solar. And the other idea is to use, um, so most space missions have relied on nuclear power with plutonium and other uh, elements that we bring from Earth. But Mars actually has quite a lot of uh, fuel for nuclear power as well, both for traditional power that we have at the moment, but also deuterium, which is a great fuel for when you finally crack nuclear fusion. So we can camp on Mars. And by the looks of it, we can settle there as well. But there are many places that we have settled, or that we have camped, that we don't settle, like Mount Everest or Antarctica. Those are sort of playgrounds for the adventurous or for the rich, or they're areas for scientific research, but they aren't homes. So what would it take for us to actually settle on Mars? Um, I was just thinking about this question. I, I, I looked back at history and wondered, why have humans settled in new places? And the way I thought about it, there were sort of three main reasons. Um, first one being uh, resources. Very simple. Second, fleeing from disaster back home. And third, pride and conquest. So let's start with the easiest one, the most practical one, resources. So as I said, Mars has a lot of deuterium, which is a great fuel for nuclear fusion. And it's very expensive on Earth. It's $1,000 a kilogram. So even accounting for transport costs, it might be worth bringing it back from Mars to Earth. But that's relatively small compared to the next bit, which is um, actually sort of in the next gold rush in, uh, in, in the solar system, which is this, asteroid mining. So asteroids are incredibly valuable because they're made of pure metal and not just iron or any old metal. It's like metals like platinum and titanium. And they, so they, because they're so concentrated, they're relatively um, easy to mine once you get there. But the, there's the, the asteroid belt, which is between Mars and Jupiter, is estimated to be worth enough to make everyone, every single person on Earth, a billionaire, a hundred times over. So there's serious money in the asteroid belt. Which is why, you know, assuming that this work won't be fully automated, why our first settlement on Mars might well be financially driven, because Mars could, Mars could be a great outpost for, for this kind of work. So that's the, that's the resources bit. And the next bit is, next option to settle on Mars would be fleeing from disaster back home. But I'm actually quite cynical about this one, because you know, Mars doesn't have much of an atmosphere. Its climate is worse than the UK. Um, the, you know, it's not easy to settle there or to make life sustainable. So Mars is not a backup Earth. Even if we get hit by an asteroid, engage in nuclear warfare, or mess up climate change, it'll still be easier to live on, live on Earth than on Mars. And let's take climate change. So this is a, a map of Europe after all the ice on Earth has melted. It's 80 meters of sea level rise. And it is a catastrophe. I mean, I've lived in London, Amsterdam, and Brussels, and they're all gone. And it'll bring, you know, hundreds of millions of people will need to move. And when you're looking at housing hundreds of millions of people, you will try and house them at the easiest, easiest location. You won't try and ship them to Mars. Because even after all this catastrophe, 
Europe still has enough physical space to host hundreds of millions of people. And it'll be easier to host a refugee camp on the summit of a mountain than to bring them all to Mars. And I also feel like if we can have the foresight to uh, rally around something as complex and expensive and fundamentally life-changing as setting up a new planet for, to live on, then we might as well take extreme measures to cur curtail climate change and save what's left of Earth. So I don't buy this backup Earth one. Um, the next reason for settling there might well be pride and conquest. So historically, this, this has a bad connotation because it's associated with colonialism, destruction, bloodshed. But Mars will be different because it doesn't have an indigenous population. There is no virgin ecosystem for us to destroy. So settling on Mars would be a victimless endeavor. And you know, I would prefer countries to compete over something in space than compete over power here on Earth and cause conflict here. So I'd prefer us to return to a space race where countries competed over a piece of rock and gained peace and scientific progress in return. Sounds like a good deal to me. So, because that, that is another thing to take into account, that we, we will gain from all this settlement research. So even the, the research that going on, that's going on at the moment into agriculture on Mars is benefiting syst food system production here on Earth. And these advanced construction methods that will likely pay off first on Mars will hopefully be used here on Earth as well. So there are very many reasons that we might go to Mars. And I wish I could tell the future and tell us where we're going. But if we're going, and if we feel the need to go, then you know, I'm sure we can camp there. I'm sure we can settle there. And it, you know, it looks like we can pay for it as well. Thank you.